Now we're going to talk about, a, about what happens when we subject an oscillator to a forcing function. So this is what happens when you push a kid on a swing, or when you blow into a flute, or try to tune a radio to a frequency. We start with our ODE describing the oscillator. And first we're going to use an exponential force. For all of this, we're going to assume that the system is undamped or underdamped. From undetermined coefficients, we know the particular solution has to be in the form of a constant times e to the rt. When we put that into the equation, each derivative is a factor of r. It's very easy to solve for the constant a, which is constant, but it depends on what the rate r is. And of course, we would have to avoid dividing by zero. That turns out to be a very important special case. We're going to consider the case when it's a harmonic forcing function, so r is imaginary. Now, if the forcing function is complex, the solution will be complex as well. So suppose we write that as real and imaginary parts. If we write the equation in operator notation, we'll put in what the real and imaginary parts are and use Euler's identity on the forcing function. Since the operator is linear, we can break it up into real and imaginary parts as well. And then if you match real to real and imaginary to imaginary, you can conclude that just from solving the e to the i omega t problem, we can solve the problem for either cosine forcing or sine forcing at that frequency. And really, we could do any combination of the two, any linear combination of those would be solved just by solving the exponential with an imaginary frequency. So now if we have our solution, we already found what A is, so we'll just put in R equals I omega from the formula before. This leading term is complex and often is useful to write it in polar form with a real g times e to the minus i phi. g is what we would call the gain. Phi is sometimes called the phase lag. So when we write it that way, the particular solution in response to the forcing function is the gain times e to the i omega t with a phase shift of phi. Let's zero in on the undamped case with a zero damping coefficient. Then if we write the complete solution, we have the homogeneous part here I'm writing it in complex form. And then that a of omega becomes very simple. And that's the particular solution. So the full solution, right, contains terms 
with both the natural frequency, the free response, and the driving frequency. Clearly, if omega is a close to omega naught, then the amplitude of the driving part becomes rather large. What happens if omega exactly equals the natural frequency? In other words, what happens if we drive the system at precisely its natural frequency? This is a situation called resonance, and it's extremely important in physics. Mathematically, if omega equals omega naught and there's no damping, then I omega is actually an eigenvalue of the homogeneous problem. So this is again where that undetermined coefficients fails. But we can fix it the way that we did in an example before. Without going through the details, here's the homogeneous part. And then the particular part is minus one half i t e to the i omega zero t. So now we have a t linearly growing t in the particular part of the solution, or the response to the forcing. So it oscillates, but it has a linearly growing amplitude. And it theoretically grows forever because this is an idealization with no damping. In the underdamped case where there is some damping present, the formulas are more complicated. Mostly we're concerned with the gain. What's the amplitude of the particular response? So using the complex modulus from the formula before, we can write it out. It's kind of a long expression, but if z is non-zero, we're never going to divide by zero, so this will remain finite for all frequencies. But it will have a maximum frequency. In other words, there'll be a frequency that you can drive the system at which maximizes the gain, or the amplitude. And if z is large enough, the best you can do is at frequency 0, where you're just giving it a constant push. Then if we look at the gain at this maximum frequency, We get this quantity to the negative 1. And as z goes to 0 for small values of z, this is roughly proportional to 1 over z. So for lightly damped problems, we still can get a very large response at the resonant frequency. Here's our resonance simulator. This is the ODE that we're solving, so I can adjust the three coefficients. Over here you see the eigenvalues of the unforced problem, the natural frequency of the unforced problem, the damping coefficient, and then the maximizing frequency 
from the standpoint of the gain in the forced problem. So with zero damping, z is zero, the natural frequency is the same as the maximizing frequency or the resonant frequency, and this is perfect resonance or true resonance. So the gain is small until you get close to the driving frequency. Remember, it's one over omega squared minus omega zero. It's one over one minus omega squared minus omega zero squared, and then it becomes infinite right at the natural frequency. So if I were to increase the spring constant, that just increases the frequency, the resonant frequency, as well as the natural frequency together. If I start increasing the damping, right away you notice that even with a very small damping coefficient, the gain has become much more modest. It's only about a factor of five now. So if you were pushing a child on the swing, their amplitude would be five times the amplitude of your push. And the most resonant frequency is always smaller than the natural frequency. But they're quite close, as you can see. So even though, um, theoretically, it is smaller, it, it, it agrees to three significant digits. By the time I move that maximizing frequency any noticeable amount, the gain has gotten quite small. And at this point, it's kind of hard to call this a resonance anymore.